Okay, so now we're going to start with our intro to acoustic telemetry tech. This presentation is going to be given by three really awesome girls who have been a part of OTN for several years now. Uh, we have Naomi. She is the data acquisition coordinator. She has a BSc in bio and earth science. Uh, she's worked a lot at the Coast Guard, and she also did an ocean tech degree at the NSCC. We also have Caitlin. She is a data man She's part of the data management and field team, and she did a BSc in marine bio here at Dow. Uh, Cass here is part of, or she did her degree in marine bio at MUN. She's part of the field team, and she has a ton of DFO field experience. So for this talk, we're really drawing on both the data management team and the field team to really give us an integrated talk about the, the tech that we can use, the kinds of data that come from it, and also the very innovative ways that the Ocean Tracking Network has been able to put all of this stuff together. So please welcome uh, Naomi, Cass, and Caitlin. Okay, so I'm Caitlin, this is Naomi, and that's Cass. Um, so we're really going to talk just about like a brief introduction of different types of technology. We're fortunate enough here to have a really large selection of, um, of technology and equipment in our uh, room and get to test out some really interesting new stuff. We work with this technology daily, both the uh, hands-on like maintenance and deployments of uh, the equipment and seeing the data that comes off of it and assisting with project records. Um, we're going to be touching kind of on as many things as we can, just like very brief details. So uh, there's definitely going to be time for questions at the end. And you can come see us later if you have anything else you want to ask, but we're not going to go like too in-depth on anything. Um, so this is very basic. Uh, everyone, I hope, knows kind of how tracking works. The point of this is to really illustrate the different ways you can integrate technology together. So there's not just transmitters and receivers, there's, you know, gliders and there's bioprobes and you can, you do like diver maintenance and you can do bo boat maintenance and you can have satellite transmitted data and it's all kind of works together in this one big interconnected system. Um, we're mo we're going to mo mostly focus on like passive acoustic telemetry, which is kind of what most people are familiar with in terms of a stationary mooring and uh, uh, mobile tags, but there is any kind of number of combinations that you can get into with this technology. Um, so again, very, very briefly, acoustic telemetry that we're talking about here is uh, high frequency sound um, transmitted through uh, the water, which is fantastic because sound moves four times faster through water than air, which is why this works really well. Um, typically, it's, uh, listening, it's, it's receivers listening for tags. Um, for example, uh, things like radio telemetry and things like that work a lot better on land just based on the transmission mediums. I think there's a talk on physics of sound later. Um, tons of different manufacturers. You saw stuff from Lowtech yesterday. Um, we are fortunate enough to have an OVC Vemco really close by, um, but there's also Lowtech, Thelma Biotel, uh, Sonotronics. I think HTI has been absorbed. Um, by an OVC now, um, but there is lots out there. Uh, we only have examples of the kind of equipment we have in store, um, but basically a lot of people choose based on what's local, what's accessible, what's most affordable, so don't pick your technology just based on what you've seen other people use because there are tons of other options out there um, that might be better. Uh, it's like important to note that tags and receivers from the same manufacturer work best together than with kind of mixing tags and receivers from different manufacturers. Um, there's some programming and intercompatibility uh, issues that can arise. Um, in some cases, not all, especially very new technologies don't work with very old ones, even within the same company sometimes. So make sure you're really thinking about what you want to hear and where you want to deploy receivers, where your tags are going to be, and, and think about what's local and accessible. and move forward with that. Uh, first of all, thank you, Lowtech and Thelma Biotel, for the images. I'm sorry I didn't caption them with the credit. <coughs> so uh, how tags work. Uh, tags generally consist of a battery, transmitter and battery, battery transmitter and a casing. The coating and the casing are present to prevent rejection of the tag by the animal it's inserted into. The, the battery life is dependent both on the 
um, sorry, the size of the battery as well as the programming that is uh, in, in the tag. Um, generally, it's important to choose the tag si uh, size based on the size of the animal. And you're looking at uh, approximately 2 to 5% of the weight of the animal is uh, the appropriate size of tag to select. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There are continuous tags, coded ID tags, and sensor tags. A uh, continuous tag transmit on, transmits on a single frequency for the extent of its programmed life. A coded tag has a pseudo-random spacing of the transmission to avoid uh, incidences of collisions that result in loss of detections. Um, a code spacing of a tag is important due to the fact that uh, certain information can only be transmitted on certain code spaces. So if you're looking at a sensor tag versus simply an ID tag, uh, you need to have a certain code space to allow for that data to be present on, in the transmission. Uh, also important to note is that certain receivers will only accept certain code spaces. <clears throat> a few novel tag types. I spoke a little bit on uh, sensor tags. Uh, sensor tags are those that will measure uh, pressure, temperature, acceleration, uh, depth, and more. Um, new sensor tag combinations are being developed constantly, and uh, it's important to note that you can get both tags that are only sensor tags, that is to say that they only transmit information about the parameters of the sensor, but also you can get tags that have both an ID of the animal and a sensor tag. And this allows you to only put the one tag in an animal when you're doing a study. <coughs> also available are acoustic data storage tags. These are fairly new. Uh, they allow you to collect data on the, um, the oceanographic parameters that, are, uh, that exist when the animal is outside of the range of a receiver. And they internally log that data. and. Uh, allow upon collection of the tag for it to be downloaded and used in, uh, as part of your data set. Also available are higher frequency tags. These are great for high density studies, especially those in fresh water. Uh, generally, you wouldn't use a tag under 200, sorry, uh, a tag greater than 200 kilohertz in salt water because of the um, the uh, way that it would transmit, it's more likely that you'll have signal attenuation. So uh, it's also good to know that a uh, higher, higher frequency tag will not um, have as many collisions, so that if you have a really high density study, you're releasing a whole bunch of small uh, specimens into a river system, say, then, uh, then you have greater likelihood of getting detections of all the specimens that you've tagged. Also available are predation detection tags. These tags, uh, through a digestible polymer, polymer, will actually change their signal when the animal that is carrying the tag is digested. Uh, that's due to the stomach acid affecting that polymer. And uh, that allows for the information about when the animal was uh, predated upon to be collected. Uh, one other of note is a high residency tag. These tags will uh, allow you to get really uh, fine scale information about movement of your animals. And um, they don't require a, a grid system of receivers. You can use fewer receivers, for, but it's a specific type of tag on a specific type of receiver. Uh, you can also use the, um, the VPS system, which I believe CAS is going to be talking about, which is uh, slightly less sophisticated. Okay, so just briefly, how receivers work. Um, they are 
made of a ceramic matrix that basically vibrates when uh, sound at a certain frequency hits it. And that's the, the hydrophone part, the transducer. And um, then the receiver converts this uh, electrical current from the vibrations and interprets it into like an ID code or sensor data and it, and it stores it in memory. Um, it's also the same way a transmitter works, basically, is it, it takes electrical currents and, and vibrates it out as sound energy. So kind of just the opposite. Um, there's uh, passive and active receivers. I'm also going to be talking about passive. Active receivers are, are ones that you move around and, and bring them to the fish kind of deal. Uh, passive is moored at the bottom, the fish come to you. Um, receivers generally listen on one or two frequencies. We have uh, some more sophisticated models that have uh, both 180 and 69 kilohertz uh, capabilities simultaneously or you know one at a time. Uh, but most receivers just list on one specific frequency versus, you know, general hydrophones, which are usually like more broadband. Um, uh, they're also programmed with uh, code maps or, or different firmware. And this basically, it's a, it's a firmware and, and it, it's algorithms that allow them to decode certain um, code spaces from tags. Uh, so it's really important to note that um, if you have the wrong firmware, if you're not up to date, or if you are using old tags with new firmware. There's going to be intercompatibility issues even within the same um, vendors. So right now, the recommended, if you're using Vemco equipment, is that you're on map um, 114 or 115, depending where, where you are in the world, because that depends on which tags are still active in different parts of the world. So it's important that when you're looking at your receiver, you're not just thinking about where you're deploying it. You have to think about how you're programming it and whether you can actually hear what you're planning on hearing. Um, so this is a screenshot from the Vemco website, so it shows that um, this is always always going to be updated, but it says that 115 is uh, recommended for uh, all regions, and 114 is recommended for North America, uh, South Africa, and Australia. And it's just basically the more you upgrade the firmware, the older tags stop being supported because newer tag models and newer code maps and newer code spaces need to be accepted, and there's just certain ways of programming, like physically. Uh, is limited. So just keep that in mind. Um, it's always updated on the websites, and I'm sure there's uh, all the vendors, if you contact them, there's all this information is available. So don't just kind of accept them off the shelf if you, if you want to critically think about kind of how your receiver is actually going to work and interact with your, with your study design. Uh, so I'm going to touch on uh, the type of receivers that we use. Like I said, or that Caitlin mentioned earlier, uh, we are very fortunate just to have Vemco a hop, skip, and a jump down the road. And if not, I'm pretty sure that they all like have just a crazy connection to their email because they're really great at getting back to us, which we uh, chat with them quite often. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about specifically is related to Vemco. Like I mentioned, there are other brands out there. Um, we just happen to use local and we're very lucky to have them around. So um, as far as our, our OTM lines that we maintain ourselves, we use a couple of different, I'm just going to come over here, um, we use a couple of different things. So um, there are the VR2s, which I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with. And I'm not going to lift these up because I had to lug them up the stairs earlier and I may or may not have dislocated a shoulder. But these are the VR4s and this is a VR3. Um, they are used in uh, kind of larger studies, more long term. And then there are VR2 ARs, which have a built in release mechanism. And I'll talk a little bit about that after. But um, so there are, there are a lot of different aspects that you can look at when you're choosing a receiver for your study. Um, you know, there, there are quite a few limiting factors. And if you only are looking to have a six month study, you probably don't need to go and get you know, one of the most expensive receivers that has a much longer battery life. Um, there are also high residency receivers, um, which communicate with the tags that Naomi was talking about earlier. Um, so that's kind of for like higher density areas where you're, you're looking at a lot of fish at once. Um, we have also been fortunate enough to use a live buoy. So that's something that we've also been in partner with Vemco with. And um, that gives you, you know, a live feed of what's, of what's happening. So they're, they have a really great um, program called Fathom that um, they're currently, they're going to be presenting on. And uh, so I'll let them touch on that a little bit more, but it is, you know, a real time acquisition of data that you're able to get basically a text message or some kind of notification sent to you, which is um, 
quite advanced in comparison to the passive um, tracking that you typically do with acoustic telemetry. And as well, there are uh, ocean drifters, and uh, we have used o uh, met ocean drifters in the past. Um, I have seen people kind of create their own in previous years, um, but we'll touch on that in a, there in a minute. Can you go back some? So um, on top of having the receiver, it's really great that you can plunk something down in the water and start to, to chat with the tags that are around. But at some point, you do need to get them back. Um, that always seems to be kind of in the back, back of your mind sometimes. You just really want to get the information. And then you're like, oh, there's, that's a very expensive anchor that's on the bottom there. So that's when acoustic releases come in. Um, we have used a, quite a few in the past. We use Edge Tech. There are Benthos receivers and there, there are, uh, I'm sorry, releases. And there is a release that comes from Vemco that are um, the, the ascents. And so once again, it's just another type of like recovery method. Um, often it has a different type of deck box that you would use to communicate with it via Bluetooth or um, with a hydrophone. And um, yeah, so there's, there's a couple of different options for that as well. And you really have to kind of look at what your study is, what the length of it might be, and also what your environment would be. So there is no kind of recipe uh, for an acoustic receiver mooring. Um, there are three very limiting factors. Your study, so what are you studying? The environment that which your, your species is in. And then also what you have um, for a budget. So, you know, in a perfect world, everybody has the most updated gear. Everybody has um, exactly the number of tags that they're looking for and that they're able to get their fish. I'm sure all of you know, super not how it works. <laughs> um, so you really need to look at what the length of your study might be, your recovery timeline, um, how you intend on, rec and on recovering it. And if you do have um, a receiver or a release that uh, has a shorter time span, but you're looking to do a longer uh, deployment, that we use the term rollover, which is that um, you need to have the accessibility to go out potentially on a vessel to be able to bring up the receiver, have any downloads via Bluetooth right onto your laptop, and then to pop another battery back in there in the most sanitary way possible to ensure that um, it would continue to work and then put it back down. Um, so like I mentioned, the offloads that you can do is the offload of, of data that you can do that via like Bluetooth or acoustically. And then you also have to keep in mind um, the flotation and your anchoring system. So we have worked in quite a few different areas. Um, for example, uh, we have a line and minus passage. And it requires quite a bit of flotation, um, something that we refer to as a, like a subs float. So much larger than normal um, and can move quite a bit with the tide, as many people are very familiar with the Bay of, uh, the Bay of Fundy and the crazy tides that come along with it. Uh, so your flotation is really important in situations like that, as well as your anchors. Um, the last thing you want to do is to have everything all set up, put it down, and for something to break or to come loose, and all of a sudden you're unable to, one, track your, your species of, of study, and two, potentially not be able to locate your um, re receiver or mooring anymore. So um, there are also anchor recovery systems. So there's pop-up buoy recovery systems. Um, sometimes when you're fortunate enough to be in an area that you don't particularly have to worry about putting a release on something. Um, I've seen with the Department of Fisheries, they've done line trawling before. So if you know the exact location, you can create some kind of uh, trawling mechanism with more than one winch to be able to pull back um, your anchoring system, which is great because essentially you're leaving nothing behind. Um, in the environment that OTN works in, often we are required to leave something behind, which is normally our anchor. We use 200-pound um, anchors for quite a bit of what we do across our Halifax line, which is 256 stations um, that leaves kind of from Duncan's Cove area, if anybody's familiar. And then also, if you look at, um, we have quite a, a, a long line that goes between um, Cape Breton to Port of Basque, which is in the Cabot Strait. 
areas like that, um, you know, when you're deploying 300, meter, uh, 300 meters in depth, the, the odds of you getting your anchor back is very little to, to no chances. Um, but we are fortunate enough to work with IMOS, which is a uh, company that does something very similar to what OTN does in Australia. And Australia has much kinder waters than us quite often. And they are actually able to um, have deployments where they are able to bring their anchor back. I don't know if you're able to click the... They were kind enough to provide me with a video that if any of you were at ICFT, they also showed um, during the OTN symposium, but was immediately after. You don't know how to get it? I think we'll have to share the link. Okay, we will share the link. But it's quite interesting. Um, their canister style, it actually, um, there's a canister that is attached to their mooring itself. So it would be somewhere on the bottom. This is a VR2W. It was a VR2AR and it had the release mechanism on the And um, when they released it with the hydrophone, the VR100, um, as the nut spun off, it then released a rope mechanism that brought it all the way to the top and then it essentially uses the um, flotation from the mooring as a buoy and you were able to you, like, use the rope to pull up the anchoring system. So that was with a much lighter anchor than what we normally use to be able to anchor the mooring, but uh, was very beneficial because they leave no trace behind and it's cost effective. You're always using the same rope and you're always using the same anchor. Um, so, like I said, you really have to take into account the depths and the currents. It's really great when you're able to use anchor recovery systems, um, but it's not always a possibility given your uh, area of study. So, uh, as Naomi mentioned, uh, there is something called a VPS, which is a Vemco positioning system. It triangulates uh, from a numerous receivers to be able to have a fine scale position produced from uh, the, the pings to the receivers. So this has a specialized coding. It's really great for smaller areas and um, th this is something that Vemco does specifically, hence the V in the VPS. Um, it does work with other receivers. <laughs> yeah. And so active tracking isn't something that we do a ton of here at uh, OTN, but um, it provides you with real-time information. It's great for a smaller location as well as fine scale and in closed off environments. Um, it allows you to be able to see the potential attachment sites of your species, um, as well as you would use direction directional or multiple hydrophones that are available and you need to do so in shorter time frames as we all know fish do move quite quickly. And this is just an example of the deck box um, without the attached hydrophone that you would use to be able to track. <coughs> I'm going to talk a little bit now about using uh, animals as oceanographers. Uh, animals that are larger, such as seals, whales, and larger sharks, can be mounted with both acoustic telemetry equipment and uh, positioning equipment, such as a satellite transmitter or GPS unit. Uh, this enables the animal to go out into its environment, collecting telemetry information uh, about other tagged animals in the area, and um, when they surface, that information can get transmitted via satellite as well as helping to confirm the position of the bioprobe animal in its environment. <clears throat> as I said, this works on seals, other animals such as basking sharks, and uh, they will go out with this unit on board that's both a transmitter and a receiver so that you get position of the animal via um, moored transmitters and uh, not only are they used uh, for telemetry purposes, they can also be used to gather oceanographic measurements. A gray seal that's out on a dive makes a great profiler. It, uh, it'll go down to depth and uh, depending on the equipment that's attached to the animal, it can collect information such as light levels and uh, depth information. 
and that, that can be combined to do things like uh, phytoplankton density measurements. And uh, this has been done to some great success by people who are actually in the room today. So I encourage you to see, search them out if you're really curious about the profiling that these seals have done. Another important thing to note is that uh, this equipment can be quite pricey. So uh, they've leveraged the fact that uh, animals such as these gray, gray seals will return to the same beaches year after year. And that means you can trade out the equipment, recover your equipment, uh, thus reducing costs for these studies. Uh, and just to be clear, this, email, uh, this image shows a seal with a VMT glued to its back and then a satellite transmitter as a hat. And they would be connected via Bluetooth. Another fun toy that uh, some telemeters get to play with are gliders. Uh, shown here is a slocum glider. This is a profiling glider. It, uh, it's released with pre-existing programming on board and it, uh, it travels autonomously through the water column. It does kind of a sinusoidal dive. So the, the wings allow it to get uh, forward movement and a, a ballasting system allows it to get vertical movement and those combine to allow it to travel forward and down and then changing the ballasting system, it will travel forward and up. Generally, this uh, type of glider would be used for profiling of oceanographic information, but we get to leverage the fact that it's out there in the ocean to collect telemetry information. Um, it has uh, onboard positioning systems. Uh, there's a satellite uh, antenna in that tail, so when it returns to the surface, the ballasting system is uh, adjusted so that the tail sticks up and it's allowed to make a connection with the satellite, both uh, locating it as well as transmitting certain uh, lower resolution data for almost live data collection. Um, and then you get the full data set when the, when the system is eventually recovered. They've done some really neat uh, things that are outside of kind of the telemetry scope, putting on extra uh, instruments to do things like translate uh, whale calls so that you can get that low scale, what species of whale is making that whale call when it's out uh, still continuing its course. And then you get the actual hydrophone, set, hydrophone data set back so that you can confirm those data points. The other image shows what's known as a wave glider, and this is a surface glider, but it also has a section of it that is at depth. That section is known as a sled, and that's actually what drives the unit forward. It uses the circular motion of the waves that are, exist everywhere in the ocean to both drive it, again, forward and up or forward and down. And as that sled proceeds in that slightly circular forward motion, it drags along this surface unit that has solar panels, it will have a, uh, a transceiver so that it can collect information, and then it also has a whole array of other oceanographic instruments, including uh, surface meteorological instruments. Uh, you can see by all the antennas that there are multiple communication units, as well as um, systems for, called, uh, like a system called AIS, which is a satellite-based system that allows it to avoid uh, interactions with sh shipping that's going on in the ocean at the same time. Because uh, I guarantee you that this unit would lose every time it comes across a ship. <clears throat> Not only can this unit collect oceanographic data and do detections of tagged animals, but it can communicate with moored receivers that are uh, fitted with a modem, such as the Vemco VR4, but there are others, and Therefore, you can use it to offload an array of receivers. And uh, anybody who works in the North Atlantic or the Southern Ocean knows that the last time you can spend on a boat, the less time you have to plan to spend on a boat, uh, the better. It, this, this unit can go out in almost all weather. It just needs some sunshine. And now they've actually come out with units that have far larger solar arrays so that the amount of sun that you might get uh, it needs far less, and uh, 
down in Florida, they're actually using this uh, off of Cape Canaveral to just go out and what they call mow the lawn. And uh, it just goes out because of the amount of sun they get, the amount of daylight that they have nearly year round, they can set that out there doing a track and collecting telemetry information near constantly, bringing it back in for maintenance and sending it right back out again. This unit does actually need somebody on land to pilot it. And uh, that's quite a fun but also arduous thing. You can imagine the stress if, there's, if you're crossing a shipping channel, say, and, uh, and there's a tanker coming and the wind's against you. You have to know what direction to turn. You have to know how soon to turn. Uh, and not all boats turn on their AIS transmitter, which means that you didn't know that ship was there until the last minute. There's lots of factors that, are, that make this equipment expensive, but if you can beg, borrow, or uh, jump on board a project that has it, then it's a, it's a great tool to have. I like lighters a lot. <laughs> So um, another piece of equipment that we have here at OTN is an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle. I'm not going to touch too much in on it as I believe today there will be a demonstration. Um, we have the CI Falcon. It is made by Saab. Um, it has a depth rating up to 300 meters. We are currently actually looking to upgrade this. Um, it allows us to have some pretty awesome film footage, which I believe during the break that they're going to put on some, some of the footage that we have from Bredore Lake, um, the Bredore Lakes, and as well, um, it just allows us to kind of jump on other projects. There's, um, we, you can do some, some biological sampling from the seafloor. You can um, also potentially retrieve moorings. Um, we have ours here rigged out with um, a skid on the bottom, so an additional attachment that has a cutter blade that in theory would be able to go and cut a line to be able to release either um, a mooring that was put down without a release or if for some reason due to biofouling or something of the sort that the release mechanism didn't work. So it is an alternative way to uh, retrieve and recover some of um, the potential issues that you can have with the mooring. As everybody knows, sometimes when you put things in the water, they don't always come back. And um, so once again, that kind of leads us into finding potentially lost gear. Um, this can happen due to biofouling, fishing implications. Maybe you tied one too many knots that day. Um, so the ROV is a way to do, to do that. Like I mentioned, we're upgrading to something that can uh, go to about 1,000 meters. Um, there are other things that you can use as a, a side scan. So a side scan allows you to um, use sonar to visualize what is on the bottom. You can sometimes be able to pick out where the mooring might be to give you an idea of where to use the ROV or other methods such as trawling, um, like the dragging operations. And... Um, if you're lucky enough and your gear happens to be in water that isn't in a crazy depth and you do have visibility, diving is also an option where you can do dive, diving deployment. You could also do a diving recovery. Everyone's favorite topic, data. Um, Okay, so super basic. Basically, there are three things that you need in order to make any sense out of your detection. So there's the actual detection data that comes off the receiver, which will give you um, the ID of the fish that you saw and timestamp. Um, you also need kind of your metadata to put any context behind that. So you need to know where your receiver was deployed, when it was deployed there to make sure that it's not out of the water. This isn't like a weird detection from those tags that are in your pocket when you're swimming around beside your receiver. <laughs> um, so it's really important to, to, to write really good records of when and where your receivers are. Otherwise, you have no position data uh, to go with these detections. Um, Similarly, you need the biological context, so tagging metadata is really important. You've got to write down what fish had which ID, how big it was, what its sex was. Everyone knows that field work is uh, pretty crazy. My biggest advice is prepare field sheets ahead of time, bring them with you, fill them in. It can be like 
I've seen people scribble on napkins. Like, I understand what happens <laughs> when, when you go out, get out on a boat. But if you get back and you can't make any sense of your data or you're like kind of like, oh, I think I put this one there, like, can you really stand behind your data set? And it's really important to start from the beginning. Just like write everything down. Take your time to fill stuff out. It's like crazy in the moment, but it's so worth it later um, in order to contextualize your detection event. Um, and this is true for like all manufacturers. What you get back is a timestamp and uh, an ID, and the rest is up to you to, to put context around. Um, things like drifters and gliders uh, make it a little tougher because the detection data, same thing, it has a timestamp, but how do you get the, um, the lat long? So the where is it? So you have to make sure if you're doing VMT deployments on basking sharks that you also have a GPS unit or some sort of sat tag. Um, and that you understand what your measure of error might be for where those detections are occurring. Um, gliders similarly have a, sat a satellite unit. Um, so you really need all three pieces of this to make any sense, no matter what type of equipment you're using. Um, also, write down serial numbers of everything, please. <laughs> um, ID codes are not unique between manufacturers or between animals. So serial numbers are the only actual unique way to tell your tags apart, FYI. <laughs> um, so similarly, uh, on the same vein, there's tons of different software you can use. Uh, so I'm most familiar with Emco. There's Vue and Fathom. Again, news from Fathom later. Um, as well as uh, my recommendation is these data sets can be uh, extremely large. Do not open them in Excel. Excel will eat your date times. Um, because it's a proprietary software that changes your formats of all your CSVs and, and crazy stuff. I recommend always open source um, CSV viewers or import your uh, data sets directly into like R or Python or MATLAB before you even look at it. Um, don't open anything Excel. Do not have your autosave on. <laughs> um, if you open an Excel by accident and it, it mangles it and autosaves, you, you might have just corrupted your data set. So, just like things to think about when you're starting out, um, I really recommend opening your CSVs directly in, in R and taking a peek at them that way. They're really easy um, code that we're going to learn later to, uh, to look at it really quickly, as well as uh, OTN develops and helps develop um, several packages. So the GLATOS uh, telemetry package we're going to be talking about later um, is developed with, by by um, OTN staff as well as uh, the staff from GLATOS uh, network as well. And uh, another package that I think we're, we're quite familiar with is VTRAC, um, which is coming out of Australia. So there's, there's a lot of things around. Um, we've also tried to try to push uh, more Python packages similarly. So Resonate uh, is basically a version of GLATOS but in Python language. Um, DiveBomb is an analysis of dive profiles from the SEAL data set that has been built um, by developers here. So there's tons of stuff out there. These are just the examples of things that um, OTN staff work on. We're trying to get kind of a centralized list or like system or somewhere to point people at that has all this code. People work really, really hard at making their own code. Um, and I'm sure everyone here has something to share with everyone else. And it's just been a lot of like duplicated efforts. So we're trying to push more of these, more of these packages and more of this kind of analysis data sharing uh, forward. But yeah. Um, that's all we have. Again, we went super brief into this. Um, so there's tons of time for questions, I think. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kim and Rob, for uh, letting us pretend we're experts for a few minutes. And if anyone has any questions, like there's tons of time, you can come up and like poke at the receivers, and we'll answer to the best of our abilities. Seal hats are not permanent. <laughs> they bolt too, so the rest falls off. So, uh, because the seals come back to the same area every year, they come to the beaches. Uh, friends like 
Kim here, scientists like Kim here, sorry, <laughs> they, they head out to places like Sable Island where it's a known seal population and they'll comb the beaches finding the animals that were previously uh, attached, affixed with these uh, instruments and recovering them as the animal molts. Kim, do you have more details about how you actually take them off of the animal or how you find the animal? Uh, the antenna to, sorry, Damien will come with the antenna to try and, uh, whoa, find, okay, to locate the, uh, locate the tag, locate the animal first as opposed to combing the island because it is kind of big. Um, and then once we locate the animal, we deploy a, a team to capture the animal and, uh, well, typically, it's, it's epoxied on, so there's that mesh, and then the, ta the tag is attached to the mesh, and then the whole thing is epoxied onto the seal. So we kind of like give them a short haircut to, to retrieve the tag, and then the rest of it falls off during the spring molt. I hope I didn't just embarrass Sarah. Did I get that right? <laughs> More questions? Uh, so, uh, sorry, so um, he had asked if there is any kind of um, recovery for uh, particularly wash-ups, so when things do go awry, what, what do we do with them? So um, John was kind enough to show him uh, a nice little sticker that we have on one of the VR2s, um, which we sticker everything. Um, so it does have a, uh, if you find this, please call. Um, often when it comes to the fishing community, it's kind of difficult to really implement the fact that it is not bad if they find our gear. We would so much rather them just tell us, especially because there are fishing implications, um, no matter where you are, unless you're in an MPA, um, but where you are in the ocean to, um, you know, nobody, at least we hope, nobody is trying to kind of mess up a study or, or interfere with your gear, but there are times that if you just lay a long line down the wrong way or if they're trawling, as we sometimes use as a recovery method, they accidentally recover um, some of our gear. So um, we have an, a, an attached number to everything and um, people can either just call in and say, hey, your stuff's here, I didn't take it anywhere, or sometimes they're kind enough to pull it onto a boat so that there's kind of a, an actual location where we can meet them. Um, there are receivers that we have in the Cabot Strait that ended up in like France and Portugal so it, there really is no end to where these things can end up um, but we do have a number we do have an email and we just really hope that people use it and we try and use like some more community outreach programs to be able to really push forward that um, we would just prefer to know where our things are than for it to be ignored so that kind of answer it kind of but I guess I'll, I'll get directly to the incident did something happen So, like I said, sometimes um, people um, that receive, sorry, I'm trying to say this very politically correct. Um, sometimes when uh, there are instances like that happen in the Minas Passage where we did have quite a few wash-ups this year, um, you know, one person talks to another, talks to another. Um, there is a, a monetary reward that is given with these. It is not very much. We all, or most of us are familiar with how expensive some of this gear is. We are not paying to get our gear back. It technically is ours. It, it is marked with things. And sometimes people call us with kind of like ransom things, like I'm gonna hold on to this. Normally they do get sorted out once you talk to them in person and kind of explain what it's there for. Um, but it does involve quite a bit of back and forth with the people that do try and kind of ask for more than what, what we're willing to offer. Because the data is worth something, but if you know we're spending thousands of dollars trying to get our, our gear back, then they'll, they might start pulling it on purpose. You know, you never know. So um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an, an odd subject, but there is a monetary reward that we, 
that we provide for those that, that help us out. Is there any other questions? So the question was, how long do the wave gliders go out and how do you avoid biofouling while they're out there? Uh, biofouling is a challenge for everyone in all environments, more so the warmer the water because the growth accelerates. So uh, wave gliders are sometimes treated, but generally it is a matter of recovering them and cleaning them off. Uh, they go out for the duration of a mission. So sometimes we'll have a wave glider through our uh, wave glider team deploy off of uh, Nova Scotia here and they'll do a mission off of Halifax going out to the shelf break and then they will uh, transit to their next mission without recovering it, uh, assuming that there's no uh, maintenance required on the glider, assuming that the battery life is still good and the weather forecast is still good that there's gonna be no damage to the equipment. So then the glider might proceed to Sable Island and do a circumnavigation of Sable Island, doing uh, a receiver work there. Uh, it then might proceed to a listening uh, mission for a, for a whales if it has the equipment already on board, or it might proceed up to Cabot Strait to do a, another offload mission. So it can be quite extensive when it's out. and. Uh, Ideally, it's the ship time to recover the wave glider that gets expensive. Once it's out there, it's one individual or a small group of individuals who are piloting it, so it's really minimal. So they try and keep it out there as long as possible and to keep it in the water as much as possible so that it can be working for how expensive it is. Oh, sorry. Uh, where you do essentially have like a real-time feed of its power, battery, um, and potentially you can see the oncoming weather, um, it does allow you to kind of make one last minute decisions or to, to be able to say, oh, we've definitely got two more weeks kind of thing. So um, it really helps that there's, there's essentially like a real time information that's coming from it. Yeah? Do you want to cover the tags? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't worked with high residency tags before. So I'm going to really hope that uh, Stephanie can come help me answer this question, if you don't mind coming up and help me answer this question. Just because Stephanie Spenbull is here from, from Innova C, and I'm going to just let her field this one because she's an expert. So can you repeat the question, please? And then can you repeat the question? How do the high residency systems work? How do the tags kind of communicate with receivers and vice versa to get these positions? Okay, the question was, how does the high residency system work? How do the tags and receivers communicate. Um, <clears throat> so the high residency system is a little bit different than the traditional system that most of you have used. The high residency system works on a different coding scheme and so the way the coding scheme works it actually allows the ID of a tag to be transmitted in a much smaller period of time than it's transmitted with the traditional system. So um, uh, you folks alluded to ping trains earlier so the typical system you would have say eight to ten pings in a transmission and that basically defines what the ID of the animal is. Well with the high residency system um, it's just a single ping that encodes the ID and so that that transmits in several milliseconds and what that means is that you can have your animals transmitting uh, you know the tags can transmit every second for example and you can have hundreds of animals in the same area without worrying about the tags interfering with each other. So, yes. Thank you. Yes, at the back. Forgive me if I miss this, but what do you recommend for any fouling? And to what extent is that an issue? Or uh, the question was, what do you recommend for anti-fouling? And uh, I believe you're referring to anti-fouling on the moored receivers, right? Yes. Um, so there used to be some pretty nasty paint that some people used to use on the gear itself. Uh, extremely toxic to environments because essentially you're making it this so that um, something is unable to to grow on, on the, the gear itself. Um, unfortunately, there isn't really a straight answer for that. Um, you recover more often, try and clean up as much as possible. Um, we don't really, 
we've we've recovered some pretty some pretty awful um, biofouled gear before. Um, we've heard of some some things that actually have been biofouled so bad to the point that they sink. Please don't get to that point. Um, but if you're looking to do something safely, um, there are certain materials that are better than others. But ultimately, when you're working in a marine environment, there isn't a a, a straight um, answer to how to avoid biofouling. A lot of it does also have to do with where your um, where you're, you're deploying, deeper has less biofouling versus the more shallow uh, locations for moorings. Is there any other questions? No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Right, so um, she asked if uh, with, uh, at OTN do we use stationary tags or how do we range test in general. Um, so s a way that we, we typically use is um, after we have the moorings down, we'll take a range test tag, put it on the back of a boat, and essentially just drift away. And then afterwards you're able to recover the mooring or you can do so um, via Bluetooth and get your information kind of immediately. Um, but that is typically how we do the range testing is, is in that formation. And Caitlin wants to add something. Um, so on the Halifax line, um, more of the range testing is kind of at the study outset, like when you're, when you're um, planning the array. Um, however, I know some of our long-term, um, like big, bigger moorings, there are uh, stationary tags deployed, for example, in the Halifax line, um, as well as VR2 ARs, you can turn the transmitters on. Um, and those can act as, as stationary tags, um, those transceivers. So there are, there, we, do, we do deploy them out there, but it's more kind of um, when we're setting up the study that we do like the full, the full range test experiments and stuff. So the Halifax line has been out for, I think in phases for 10 years. So that, that was quite a while ago when it, when it first uh, would have been tested, but I think there's still some more tags out there. Um, you frightened me with your comment about Excel. <laughs> Good. Um, so the question was, uh, why am I scaring everyone about Excel? <laughs> um, so it doesn't corrupt the VRL files. If you have the VRL files, that's fine. I find a lot of people, um, because VRLs are uh, a data type that isn't compatible with other um, software, a lot of people convert immediately to CSV, and that's what they're sending to their collaborators and to their students, and what they start working from is the CSVs immediately. Um, because that's kind of you know a tabular data format that people are more familiar with. So it's really the CSVs that you have the problems with. I know VRLs get lost, um, and CSVs get lost, and it's more likely that the CSVs will be corrupted than the VRLs will be lost, hopefully. Um, but if you keep the VRLs, you should be fine. <laughs> I'll still heed your advice, but I Good, yeah. So how can you tell if Excel has messed up your data? Um, generally, what happens is it cuts the seconds off of the detections. Um, so you'll notice it's really the date times that like are very obvious. Like it'll be some like random jumbled numeric format instead of like year, month, day that you're familiar with, and that's like a good, a good suggestion that you should delete that file and export again from from view or something. Um, also, there's like a, only a maximum number of rows that can be uh, imported into Excel. So if you have like a huge data set, like you've joined a bunch of CSVs together, when you open it in Excel, it might cut off like, it's like a lot of rows that it allows, but these data sets can get crazy. So it could cut off some of your detections if you're trying to look at it in Excel. Kim? So um, Kim wanted to know where the oceanographic data from the glider goes and if that's available online. So the glider team has their own website. It's uh, sea otter, C-E-O-T-R, I think. Uh, .dell .ca? I'm not sure. Uh, they, changed, they changed their website. It's not gliders.dell.ca anymore. seaotter.ocean.dell.ca, final answer. Um, but yeah, so they do have a data portal there. It has a lot of their profiles as well as I think you can like download uh, like f low, low resolution probably, but like conductivity and temperature and, and a few other parameters. Um, and I do think they post, uh, they, they load all their stuff to a higher level. Um, 
observing systems such as ERDAP um, and, and places like that. So there, the data does kind of, it's open access and it does get fed around all the oceanographic stuff. So the question was, will the OTN database accommodate data from other manufacturers outside of MCO? The easy answer is yes. Uh, it becomes difficult because of the overlaps in the, um, in the programming of the tags to, for us to properly resolve the information. As far as a place to warehouse your data, to archive it, to allow it to persist beyond your study and beyond potentially your funding, we are absolutely a place where that can happen. As far as 100% resolution of your detections of your animals on other receivers, that can become more difficult because of those overlaps that I mentioned. And so it's very important to have the entire information about the tag, including serial number, code space, and ID that's been programmed into it, as well as the temporospatial information about where the tag was released and when it was released, as well as the estimated life of the battery of the tag. So once you gather that entire set of information, it becomes uh, an easier job of completing that process that we like to do. Um, sorry, also, uh, I was just going to say that the more people share other manufacturers with us, we are constantly changing and designing our database to fit our users and our, uh, our I guess, you guys. <laughs> so if uh, the more people ask for, the, the more we can work on it and develop it. Um, but you had more? Um, so you had a question about the open protocol that some of the vendors are doing and if that's going to live in our database. Um, hard, hard yes is what I'm getting. So that uh, is something that we're, we've been involved with kind of uh, as, a, as a, um, a warehouse for, with, for the, as the infrastructure for, for potentially allowing this to happen and storing this. Um, I think it remains to be seen, but, but yes. Looking for people to, to share it with us now, looking for people to tell us what to do, basically. That's where we're at. <laughs> yeah, Jake? The question was, as OTN builds this data set, massive data set from all of the research that's going on, what's our plan? What are we going to do with the data in the future? The easy answer is, it's not our data, it's your data. What do you want us to do with it? And what do you want to do with it? The harder answer is that uh, we're trying really hard to make as much data as possible available, but that comes at the uh, permission of the researcher. So we need researchers to tell us that they're ready for their data sets to go and be used by other researchers uh, to extend those collaborations. Uh, when you've published your paper, when your tags are no longer pinging in the water, are you ready for another researcher at another university to use that data set for something completely different or to extend what you've done into a new, a new area of study. I think that might be all of the time we have. Oh. Sorry, one more question. Have you ever had an instance where two different studies are telling you two different, or conflicting stories about a tag? The question is, have we ever had an instance when, sorry, can you repeat it one more time? Have you ever had an instance when two different studies are telling you different information about a tag or an array? And how do we resolve it? <clears throat> so I'm just trying to, uh, yes. The, um, are you referring to like a double reporting where two, two projects are reporting the same information? either the same information or different information. So we, uh, we check and double check as we're processing to confirm that we haven't had, say, the same tag or the same receiver reported by two different projects. 
And we do that through the completeness of the metadata, whether it's the serial number, also the temporal spatial information, and somewhat the kind of the animal measurement information. Uh, and once we come up with uh, an issue that seems to be a conflict, we return to the researchers and try and get it clarified. Often there's collaborations going on that, that we weren't necessarily made aware of. Everyone wants to make sure that we're getting the data, so a couple different people from those collaborations are sending it on to us. And then it's a matter of requesting, requesting that the researchers clarify where they want each piece of metadata to belong, what project, or whether it's all one big project. One more question. <laughs> The question to surprise is which type of glider, the Slocum profiling glider or the surface wave glider, do we pref does OTM prefer to use for offloading receiver lines? We prefer to use the, the surface matter wave glider. Uh, we're able to, um, well, it's mounted, with, it has the equipment on board in order to do that offloading. The Slocum glider doesn't. But in addition to that, uh, the Slocum glider is pre-programmed with a mission, whereas the wave glider is in constant communication. So uh, the wave glider can circle a station, essentially, to ensure that there's connection with the receiver and to persist in that, on that station until the, the full offload has occurred. And, uh, and then it will be able to transmit information immediately back to, uh, back to the, the land station. Uh, before it moves on to the next one, if a receiver, <clears throat> if the information has been given that's incorrect about the receiver communication, then you can make a live fix to to properly communicate with the receiver to to give it m new information about how to connect. Uh, those are you know a couple of the primary reasons why you would use the wave lighter. And uh, there's lots of people in the room who know a lot about gliders. Uh, at least two people over in the corner on the couches have worked on the glider team on the data side of it. So we have more questions about glider data. I point you at uh, John Pye, the guy standing there. He's smiling, always. <laughs> Thanks, Kim.